What is happening guys, it's Modded Warfare here. Welcome back to another PS4 tutorial. So in this one, we're going to be covering how to install Linux on the PS4 to the internal hard drive of the PS4. This is something that has been requested in my previous Linux tutorials where I show you how to install Linux to the external hard drive. And this has also been made easier very recently. So it should be easier now to install Linux to the internal hard drive. There's also been several other improvements to Linux on the PS4 since my last tutorial. So I thought it was time for an update. For example, we have a new distro PSX IT Arch version 3, which has a lot of uh, useful features built in, plus a newer version of Mesa that's built into this distro to give you better performance. Plus, we also have the notorious PS4 Pro performance issue fixed now as well. So that was an issue before where the PS4 Pro would get about half the performance of a base PS4 when running Linux. That's now been fixed. So if you are on a PS4 Pro, you can get better performance now with your PS4 Pro. So, so quite a lot of improvements there. Let's go ahead and dive right into the tutorial. Now, even though we're going to be installing it to the internal hard drive of the PS4, you're still not going to lose any stuff on the PS4. You'll still have all of your games. You'll still have your PS4 operating system. Again, we're still setting this up like a dual boot setup so that you can switch between the PS4's OS and the Linux distro. So you're not going to lose any of your stuff. So don't worry about that. So let's go ahead and get into it. So first thing you need to do is obviously you need to have a jailbreakable PS4 that's on firmware 9.00, as you can see right here. And then you also need to load the gold hen payload by going onto your internet browser, going to your favorite exploit host. You can go to es7in1.site, which has a bunch of different exploit hosts that you can pick in case one of them is down, for example. Or you can just go straight to a good one like kmeps4.site. So if you go to kmeps4.site or go to es7in1.site and select one of the exploit hosts and then load the gold hen payload from here and plug in the USB drive with the hacked image on it to jailbreak the system and get the gold hen payload running. If you don't know how to do that, then check out my full jailbreak tutorial that will be linked on screen and in the description. Okay, so once you have Gold Hen running, if you're installing Linux to the internal hard drive, you then want to enable the FTP server in Gold Hen by going to the Gold Hen options here, going down to server settings and enabling the FTP server. So mine was already enabled. If I re-enable it here, you'll get a notification that shows your IP address and port number to connect to on FTP. So now we have the FTP server running. Next, we're going to go to the settings option here and we're going to scroll down to system and system information. And in here, you can see it shows the south bridge. If this doesn't show up, it's because you either don't have Gold Hen running or the version of Gold Hen you're running is too old. So use one of the newer Gold Hen versions like 2.3 or higher, and you should see your south bridge in here. So just take a note of the south bridge that you have. So in my case, it's Belize 2 and then we can switch on over to our computer. We need to download the kernel file for the type of Southbridge that you have. So there's Aeola, there's Belize and Belize 2, and then also Bacal as well. So first of all, obviously because I'm on Belize, I'm gonna download one of these particular kernel versions here. So what you wanna do is start with the most up-to-date kernel because it's gonna support more features. So you want to download the, the one that is on the highest kernel version. Try that first. If that doesn't work, then work your way down to the next one, like 5.3.18. And again, if that doesn't work, then go down to the 4.14 kernel, which is the most stable. However, again, because it's an older kernel, it's not going to support as many features. So preferably, you want to do one of the higher ones and work your way down. So in my case, I noticed that the 5.15 one doesn't work particularly well on my PS4 Pro. However, this one does work quite well, 5.3.18. So I'm going to download this one right here. So do the same with whatever, you know, Southbridge chip you have. Also notice that the uh, Bacal Southbridge does not have HDD support, which means you'll have to boot Linux from an external hard drive or USB stick if you are on the Bacal Southbridge, whereas the Aeola and Belize all have HDD support. So you can boot Linux from the internal hard drive of the PS4 on those PS4 models. So once you've gone ahead and downloaded the kernel version, which is the BZ image file here, you can then go ahead and download the distro that you want to use. So I would recommend right now trying the PSX IT Arch distro because it's the kind of most up-to-date distro that has a lot of cool features built in. So we're gonna go ahead and download this one. So it's in Italian, but if we scroll down here, you can find the download right here, psxitarch.tar.gz and you can just go ahead and download it from here. 
So there's also other distros, of course. You can also head to ps4linux.com forward slash downloads. This website has cataloged a lot of distros that you can download as well as the login. So you can see there's PSX IT Arch V3. You know, you've got SteamOS. You've got, you know, lots of other distros here. You've also got Fedora based distros, Ubuntu based distros. So you can download whichever one you want to use. So once you've got your distro downloaded, the next thing we need to do is download the interim file. So there's this interim FS. So in here, if I extract this out to my computer, again, this will be linked in the video description as well. So in here, there's a different interim FS for the internal hard drive and the external hard drive. So if you're booting Linux from an external storage device, like a USB or external hard drive, you would use this one here in the external HDD folder. And if you are booting from the internal hard drive, then you'll be using this one right here. Okay, so that's all we need. We need our interim FS, our BZ image, and our distro. So we are all good. So now we're going to open up an FTP client like FileZilla. So we're going to go ahead, open up FileZilla here, and we're going to connect up to our PS4 by typing in the PS4's IP address in the host box. And then the port number is 2121. And we're going to quick connect to connect us to our PS4's hard drive. So this is for installing to the internal hard drive. So when you're installing to the internal hard drive, we connect to our PS4's hard drive and then we go into the user folder and then the system folder. And inside the system folder, we're going to create a new folder in here, a new directory. So right click and create a new directory called boot. And there we go. So inside the boot folder, this is where we're going to copy all of our files. So we're going to take our distro, our psxitarch.tar.gz or whatever distro you've downloaded. And we're gonna copy it in there. So you can see it there uploading. And then we're also going to take our BZ image file and copy that in and our interim FS as well for the internal HDD. We're also going to drag that in as well and let that copy. Okay, so we've got all three files copied over here into the boot folder. So what you wanna do now is if you've copied any other distro in here besides PSX IT Arch, you want to rename it to the same name. So you want to rename whatever distro you downloaded, let's say it's Fedora or something, then you want to right click and rename it to psxitarch.tar. either gz or xz, whichever it is. It might be a gz file, it might be an xz file. So rename it to psxitarch.tar.xz or gz and you should be good. And the reason why we do that is we're using the install script for psxitarch to install the distro. So if you have a different distro that's got a different name, you just want to rename it to the same name so the script can recognize it and unpack it. So if you're going to be booting Linux from the external hard drive or a USB stick, then obviously you want to connect that USB stick up to your computer and just copy those same files into the root of the USB stick or external hard drive, making sure that the external hard drive or USB is formatted in FAT32 format it must be it must not be in any other format it must be fat32 and it must be using the mbr partition style you can use a program like rufus to format the drive in fat32 format with the mbr partition scheme so make sure you do that and then copy those same files to the root of the usb connect it up to your ps4 and you'll be ready to boot linux okay so let's go ahead and switch back over to the console now now that we have everything set up so last but not least, if you're booting Linux from the internal hard drive, you want to check how much storage space you have available. So if we go into storage, you can see I currently have, I think, a 500 gigabyte hard drive. Yeah, or actually it may be less than that. I've only got 400 gigabytes on this drive. And you can see there's 235 gigabytes currently being used. So I think I will give the Linux install about 100 gigabytes. So just make a note of how much space you have left so you know how much storage you want to dedicate to your Linux install. So in my case, it's going to be about 100 gigabytes I'm going to give to my uh, Linux install. So now we are pretty much ready to boot into Linux now. So what we want to do is get everything set up correctly for the screen. So we're going to go into our settings and we're going to scroll down to sound and screen. And we want to change our video output settings and we're going to change the resolution from whatever it's currently on to 1080p. It must be set to something lower than 4K. 1080p, it might work on 720p as well. I'm not sure, but 1080p is the recommended. It must not be 4K. If it's 4K, you will not regain a signal when you boot into Linux. 
So we're going to select 10 ATP. Then we want our RGB range set to whatever it's currently set to, limited or full. I guess I'll just set it to full right now. And then we want HDR off and we want deep color output. I would set off as well. So that's how you want things set up. 10 ATP, full, off and off. And we should be good. Next, you want to head down to system and make sure that enable HDMI device link is disabled. And you also want to disable HDCP. Okay, there we go. So once you've got all of that turned off, you should be good to go. Also, if you have a PS4 Pro, it might be a good idea to enable boost mode to give you a bit more performance. I'm not sure if this actually makes any difference when booting into Linux. Probably not, but I just enable it just in case. Obviously, if you're on a base PS4, that does not apply. So now we're going to head into the internet browser. We're going to go back on our exploit host. So in my case, I'm still using kmeps4.site. And on here, we're going to go to our Linux VRAM payloads. And we're going to load the one gigabyte VRAM payload. So if you're on a PS4 Pro, you're going to want to run the one that says Dash Pro because it gives you better performance on PS4 Pros. And if you're on a base PS4 or a slim PS4, you're going to select the one gigabyte VRAM payload. You can either use the PSX IT Linux one gigabyte or the NASCI YT Linux one gigabyte, whichever one works best for you. So in my case, because I'm on a PS4 Pro, I'm going to run the Pro one gigabyte VRAM. You must run the one gigabyte VRAM for installing the distro. These other ones, two gigabyte, three gigabyte and four gigabyte and five gigabyte in some cases, and those are just for once you've already got Linux installed. So for installing the distro, we need to run the one gigabyte payload. Okay, so as you can see, we have successfully booted into the shell. You'll lose signal for a few seconds and then you should regain signal. Now, what you'll notice is that the PS4 itself, it should be emitting a blue LED and kind of flashing purple every couple of seconds that means you are booted into Linux successfully. So if you see that on the front of your PS4, but you don't have a signal, then there's something going on there, like perhaps your settings weren't set correctly with, with 1080p and disabling HDR and all of that stuff, and HDCP being disabled. Double check all of those settings if that's what you're running into. Um, also, make sure you don't have any USB devices connected to the PS4 while you're booting into Linux. Don't have the charge cable connected for your controller, don't have any keyboard or mouse or anything connected when you're initially booting into Linux, when you're running the payload. Once you actually get into the shell like we are right now, you can then plug in a USB keyboard to start typing. Another thing that can happen is the PS4 can just switch off when you try to boot into the Linux loader, in which case you might have to either try a different Linux loader payload or try a different BZ image file because that can often be the cause. Also, if you plug in a keyboard once you're actually into the shell and you try and start typing something in and it just immediately crashes or as soon as you plug the keyboard in, it just locks up, then that can also be a sign that the BZ image file that you're using is not compatible with your PS4 model and you'll have to try another one. So those are some of the common issues that you can run into. So, so once you're into the shell, you can then plug in a USB keyboard and type in the following command if you're installing to an external hard drive or USB stick. The command is exec space install dash psxitarch.sh. Even if you're installing a different distro, that is the command execute install dash psxitarch.sh. Just like that, hit enter and it will start installing the distro. If you're installing to the internal hard drive of the PS4, like I am, in this case, then the command is install dash Linux dash HDD dot SH. So we enter that command, we hit enter, and then we get a prompt here that says enter the amount of storage to dedicate to your Linux install. So that's why we checked how much storage we had available before we booted into Linux. So in my case, I know I have at least 100 gigabytes or more available on my PS4 hard drive. So I'm going to give the Linux install 100 gigabytes. But again, you can just give whatever storage space you want here. I think there is a minimum amount. So I think if it's like lower than 20 or something, then it might not it might not work. So anyway, 100 gigabytes in my case, because there's enough space. So enter how much space in gigabytes you want to dedicate to your Linux installation and then press enter. 
and then it will set everything up. So this part here can take a while depending on how much space you've dedicated to your Linux install. The more space, the longer it will take. But once it's done, it will then start extracting the distro uh, into the space that it's set up here. So there we go. It's now extracting the distro. And now all you have to do is wait for this to install. It can take about 10 minutes, maybe a bit longer. So just wait for this to finish installing and then it will either boot you directly into the distro or it will prompt you to enter some more commands into the shell. Okay, so as you can see here, it says install complete. If you're reading this message, type resume boot a few times to boot into the distro. Okay, so we have successfully installed it. So all we need to do is type in resume dash boot if it doesn't boot you into the distro automatically, which it might do. So we'll hit enter. So it didn't work. So we'll type it in again because it does say do it a few times. Resume dash boot. And there we go. As you can see, we're now booting into the distro. So what happens here is another weird thing that happens on my PS4 and might happen to your PS4. It depends is I just get a black screen here. So I lost signal for a few seconds and now I just get a black screen. So if this happens to you, I mean, this might not happen. You might just boot straight into the distro just fine. But if this happens, then you need to refresh the HDMI signal to your PS4, which you can do by, you know, switching inputs on your monitor or unplugging the HDMI and plugging it back in, which is what I've just done here. So now I have no signal. So once you've refreshed the HDMI signal, we're going to do Control Alt F2 and then F1. So hold down Control and Alt and press F2 and then F1 and it should refresh. And there we go. We've now booted successfully into the distro. You can now connect a USB mouse or, for example, you can actually use the PS4 controller's touchpad as a mouse. So you can plug in the charge cable for your controller and use that as a mouse instead. So, of course, you can access your Wi-Fi. If you're on Wi-Fi, you can access the Wi-Fi networks from here if the drivers are working on your PS4. Otherwise, you can, you know, connect via a LAN cable. So before we get into anything, I'm just going to customize this a little bit because this menu is very tiny. It's very small. It's going to be hard to see on YouTube here. So what I'm going to do is go to JWM config and we're going to go to the config menu, which will open up the settings here. And I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to change this to make the tray appear at the bottom. So under Y, I'm going to change the Y axis to 1030 which will put this taskbar at the bottom of the screen like it is on, you know, a Windows system, which is what I'm used to. So I'm going to change that and then I'm going to scroll down to, I think it's menu style. Here we go, menu style. And I'm going to change the font from size 9 to size 14 to make it bigger and easier to see here. So we're going to just save that with Control S or File Save. And then we should be able to refresh the menu by going down to JWM config and refresh app menu. And there we go, it now appears at the bottom and everything else is much bigger. Okay, so we've got the distro all set up and ready here. So I'm gonna cover some of the new features that are built into this distro specifically first. So firstly, what we've got going on here is we have the Bluetooth manager, which works pretty well. So if you go into the settings, you can go to Bluetooth manager and from here, you can connect your Bluetooth devices, specifically the PS4 controller. Most other distros use a different Bluetooth manager that's built in, which doesn't really allow you to pair your PS4 controller. Although this one should work, providing the Bluetooth drivers are working on your PS4 on Linux, depending on what kernel version you're running and all of that stuff. So for example, what we can do here is I'll take my PS4 controller, hold down the share and PS button down at the same time, keep it held down until the light starts flashing. And that means it's searching. So then we're going to search on the Bluetooth manager to try and find our controller. It should show up here. There we go. PS4 wireless controller. So we can right click and connect. And there we go. It is connected and it's working. It's now showing up blue and I can use the touchpad to control the mouse. So that is indeed working. So you can connect up a Bluetooth keyboard or mouse this way or your PS4 controller so that you can use your PS4 controller wirelessly on your emulators and games. Speaking of emulators and games, there are a few built in. There's the CMU emulator, which allows you to run Wii U games, although it's not really gonna run well on a PS4, unfortunately, unless you can find some games that use more simplistic graphics. There is also the Dolphin emulator, which allows you to run GameCube and Wii games. That one should work pretty well. I've used it to run games like Mario Kart Wii before on the PS4 and it's ran just fine. So that's handy. There's also Duck Station, which is a PS1 emulator. Apparently that one runs really well too. 
There's also the Nintendo 64 emulator here and the PSP emulator, as well as RetroArch, a multi-system emulator that allows you to, you know, install other emulators and run them through RetroArch. So all of that's built in right there. There's also Steam built in in the network settings for some reason. So in terms of running games and emulators, just a couple of, of things to mention here. With graphics, you always want to make sure you change it to Vulkan if it's not already set to Vulkan because that will give you better performance. And again, you can also change the Vulkan compiler, uh, which is right here. You can also change it from ACO to LLVM in case uh, you know it performs better in one versus the other. So you can always do those kind of things to try and get better performance. In terms of Steam, which is a network, uh, make sure you use the Steam runtime version to download your games and install updates and all of that stuff. And then when you're ready to run the game, you then want to run the Steam no browser version, which disables the browser to give you better performance or, well, it gives you more RAM essentially. So it uses up less memory than the normal runtime version. So because it uses less memory, that's more memory towards your games. So if you use the no browser version, you just need to select view in the Steam settings and go down to small mode, which will then minimize it to your game library so that you can launch your games from there with the no browser version. You've also got language support here, so you can change your system language. And then also you've got the keyboard language here as well, keyboard layout. So you can change your keyboard layout from this interface. So for example, I changed mine to GB for Great Britain to change the keyboard layout. And then that will also then open up for the option to change the layout in the console. So when you're actually trying to you know, type anything into the terminal, then you can also change the layout from here as well. So that works pretty well. That does require a reboot to take effect though. So next we have some other handy features built in here in the settings or in the system settings. So in here, we've got the ability to mount the internal PS4 hard drive. That only works if you have the hard drive like decryption key uh, in the correct location. That will just mount the user directory the P on the PS4 hard drive so you can access that from Linux. You also have tear free configure, which allows you to fix screen tearing, which is on by default. So it kind of minimizes screen tearing, which can be quite a problem uh, when running games through Linux here on the PS4. So that kind of fixes that issue. You can also turn it off to try and you know avoid issues that it might cause. And then also we have a few other things, the Vulkan configure option. This is very useful because some games by default, it uses the ACO compiler. But, you know, some games or emulators might not work with the ACO compiler or they might work better with the LLVM compiler. So you can just switch it on the fly and then any application you launch will then use that compiler instead automatically. And you can just switch between them quite easily. So that is another handy feature that's built in right there. And then last but not least, you've got change LED color and fan control. So LED color just allows you to change the LED on the front of the console to different colors. So not really that useful, just, uh, I don't know, just a little interesting thing. And then you've got PS4 fan control. This is useful if it works on your PS4. It doesn't always work depending on what model you have. But yeah, you can basically adjust the temperature here. So if I put it all the way down to 45, then the fans are going to kick up high to try and keep the PS4 at that temperature. So, you know, if you're worried about your PS4 overheating, you could adjust this a little bit to kick the fans up a bit higher. If you're using any kind of overclock payloads or, you know, you're trying to overclock the system, then obviously you're going to want to keep the fans high to keep the system cool. So that's one thing that you can do. We'll just go ahead and put this back to normal here to uh, make it so the fans aren't too noisy. You also have a few kind of hotkeys built in. If you hold down Alt and press F6, it will take a screenshot. And also, if you hold down Alt and press F10 and then F12, it will kind of refresh the screen. So if you run into any issues where, you know, like you lose signal or something, then you can do that to try and regain it. Uh, so those are kind of the handy features that are built in there. So, so a couple of other things that I typically recommend doing when you first install Linux. One big one is to set up swap space, especially if you're going to be running games and emulators, because again, there's not much memory built into the PS4. And some of that memory gets allocated as video memory, which means you have even less RAM to work with in the PS4. So conserving memory is very important. And if you use up all the memory in your system, then the whole system is just going to lock up and freeze completely. So if you set up some swap space, which allocates some space on the hard drive, 
uh, just to you know use as RAM when you use up all the RAM in your system. It just prevents the system from seizing up completely, especially if you're caching a lot of shaders in memory, which is what happens a lot with emulators. They cache a lot of shaders, so it requires a lot of memory. So it's definitely recommended to set up some swap space. So if we check how much swap we currently have in the system by opening up a terminal, and we'll zoom in and we'll run HTOP. And as you can see, there's no swap available right now. So what we're going to do is set up some swap space. So in order to do this, first of all, we're going to type in sudo f allocate dash l. And then I'm going to give 4G, which is four gigabytes of swap space. You can set whatever swap space you want. So four gigabytes in this case, and then we'll do forward slash swap file to put it to the swap file right here. And then we enter the password, which is change it. Change it is the password. Okay, operation not supported. So I'll have to add the dash X at the end, uh, which should force it to work. Uh, but it takes a little while here. Okay, so once we've got the swap file set up, we need to enable it. So we need to give it the appropriate permission. So we're going to do sudo chmod 600 forward slash swap file. And then we'll do sudo mk swap forward slash swap file to make it a swap file and then we'll do sudo swap on forward slash swap file and that will go ahead and enable it and then we want to enable it automatically when we next boot into the distro so we don't have to enable it every single time so to do that we need to edit a file by doing sudo nano space forward slash etc forward slash fstab so we're going to go ahead and do that and then scroll down to the bottom and we're going to add it in here by doing forward slash swap file and then tab over here and we're going to do none and then tab over here swap and tab over here and then sw and then tab over here and put zero space zero just like that and then we're going to do control x to exit y for yes to save and then enter and then that will save that so the swap will be enabled on every boot Okay, so if we go back to HTOP here, you can see we now have four gigabytes showing for swap space. So we are all set. So another couple of things just to mention here, if you're not used to using a Linux based system, is if you want to install any additional applications, for example, Lutris isn't installed here, which I'm kind of surprised. I would expect Lutris would have been one of the things that was included, but it's not. So if we want to install that, it's basically a multi-system game launcher that has install scripts that can be used to install games and other game launchers to get them to work on Linux. So it's a useful application to have. So if you want to install it or install other apps, you do sudo pacman dash uppercase s space and then the name of the application you want to install. In this case, that would be Lutris. So we type in Lutris, press enter, enter the password, which is change it and then Y for yes to install. And then that should go ahead and install uh, Lutris on the system. Okay, there we go, it should be installed. So if we head here, we go to games, you can see Lutris has been automatically added, which is pretty handy. So that's basically how you install other apps and utilities. Um, another thing you can do is update the distro if you can't install apps. So if you try sudo pacman-s like we just did, and it doesn't install, it says there's out of date packages and stuff like that, then you'll probably have to update the distro. You can update the distro. I wouldn't really recommend doing it though, unless you just cannot install other applications um, because it can be quite awkward to update the distro sometimes. Typically you type in um, pretty much the only way that I could get it, get it to actually update is by typing in sudo pacman dash key and then doing dash dash refresh keys because there are some out of date keys. Um, so I have to enter that command and let that run through, which takes a while. Okay, so once that runs through successfully, the next thing is to type in uh, sudo pacman dash uppercase s lowercase yu to perform the actual system update. Again, type in the password, which is change it. There. Okay, so we type in y for yes, press enter, and that will install all of the packages. Now, the way this should be set up is that it should be set up in the pacman configuration file to ignore any custom drivers. Obviously, you don't want to overwrite any drivers when you're updating the system, like any packages that use custom drivers with the stock drivers. Otherwise, obviously, you're going to run into issues. So it should be set up here to ignore those so it will not update those. 
Okay, there we go. So it should have updated successfully. We can test by typing in the same command. And it should, hopefully, oops, wrong password. Uh, it should hopefully say that everything's up to date. There we go. There's nothing to do. So it has successfully updated everything. So that's how you update the system. So also, if we want to change our password real quick, we can do P-A-S-S-W-D, I believe. And there we go. So current password is change it. And I'm going to change it to just the A, the A key on my keyboard so it's quicker to type in. There we go. So you can change your password by doing that. P-A-S-S-W-D. So I think that covers pretty much everything in terms of setting up Linux on your PS4. Obviously, it's going to be a bit different depending on what distro you're using if you're not using PS Zeta uh, version 3. So if we want to go back to the PS4 OS, we can just return to Orbis OS, which is the PlayStation 4 operating system. If you're on another distro, it will just be called, you know, restart. So you're basically just restarting the system. So if we select that option here, it should, first of all, just shut down the system and do a normal restart on the PS4. So we just wait a few seconds. OK, so back on the PS4 here, we're going to run the Gold Hen payload once again, so we can just head over here, run Gold Hen version 2.3 or whatever the latest version is. OK, so once we have Gold Hen running, as you can see right here, a couple of things to mention, your storage will still look the same. So the storage amount, as you can see here, still says 235 gigabytes free. Obviously, that's not true. There's an extra 100 gigabytes that's reserved for the Linux install. So if I tried to install like a 100 gigabyte game here, it would say there's not enough storage space, even though it looks like there's enough storage space in the settings here. So if you ever want to delete your Linux installation sometime in the future, then all you need to do is reconnect to the PS4 via FTP and then head into the user directory and then the home directory. And in there, you can see we have a file called linux.img, which is 100 gigabytes. And that is our Linux installation. So you can just delete that file if you want to free up space on your system and get rid of your Linux install. Or if you want to install another distro, then just delete that file and then just put another distro in the user system boot folder. And uh, then you can just go ahead and run the Linux payload and install a different distro. If we want to boot back into Linux again, all we need to do is, of course, go back onto your exploit page. So again, kmeps4.site or any other uh, exploit host. And then we can go to the VRAM payloads. And this time we can run a larger video memory payload since we already have the distro installed. So I could run the two gigabytes of VRAM payload. That's the one that I would say is kind of like the general all purpose a Linux payload to run is the two gigabyte one that gives you six gigabytes of system memory and two gigabytes allocated as video memory. But obviously, if you're trying to run a specific game that's heavy on video memory, then you might want to use the three gigabytes of VRAM or four gigabyte VRAM payloads. So I'll run the two gigabytes of VRAM payload here this time. And there we go, waiting for payload. And what it will do here is it should just automatically boot me straight into the distro. So we get the shell showing up here for a few seconds, but it should just boot us straight in. There we go. Welcome to Arch Linux and it should boot us. If it doesn't boot us in again, you can type in the resume dash boot command a few times, but it shouldn't require that. It should just boot you straight in automatically like it has done here. Again, I get the black screen issue where I have to, you know, reseat my HDMI cable and then do the control alt F2 and F1 to get it to show up here. And then obviously you can plug in your peripherals once you have the distro actually booted into the shell. Otherwise, um, you can get this kind of no signal issue if you have, you know, input devices connected when you're actually loading the payload. So just be aware of that. But as you can see, it booted us straight into the distro here. Everything's still here just as it was before. So anyway, that is essentially how you install Linux on the PS4 and install it to the internal hard drive of the PS4 so that you can free up a USB port. But now you have a Linux distro that you can run alongside your PS4 operating system. So as well as running your PS4 games and RetroArch and other emulators on the PS4 operating system, you can now boot into Linux. You can use a proper web browser. You can access, you know, things like Netflix and various other things on the actual system, as well as being able to, you know, load other emulators like CMU and Dolphin for Wii games and uh, GameCube games and stuff that you can't currently run on the PS4 emulators. And yeah, you can now have access to running PC games too. So a lot more options when you're able to dual boot into Linux like this. 
So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video or found the information useful. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe and I'll hopefully see you guys in the next video.